Good afternoon and welcome to our June 18th Covenant Sunday. This Covenant Sunday, we're going to give you an opportunity to have about 10 minutes silent adoration before we begin the talk. So we're very help, happy that we can do this and we hope that you enjoy your time with our Lord and His Mother in the Shrine of Light. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Praised and adored without end be Jesus Christ in the most blessed sacrament.
Most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every morning time. O sacrament, most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every morning time. O sacrament, most holy, O sacrament divine. All praise and all things given be every one of time. Good afternoon and welcome to our Covenant Sunday again in June. This Covenant Sunday falls on Father's Day. And if you notice, every Covenant Sunday we always have a special theme that we can follow, and that assures us that divine providence is behind these covenant days. This covenant Sunday is Father's Day, and what we're going to do this Sunday is we're going to take many excerpts from the encyclical Patris Corde, which translated into English means with a father's heart. And after we've first had examples of fatherhood, and we've taken excerpts from the encyclical, and then we will also apply these to certain principles that we see in our life that are hidden often, and we are not aware of them. In Patris Corde, with the Father's Heart, near the end of the section, we read, The World Today needs fathers. That's obvious. We know the world needs fathers. But then to ensure that we really understand this, the encyclical continues. It, meaning the world, has no use for tyrants who would domineer others as a means of compensating for their own needs. So we don't have dictators who want to compensate for their desire to be on top of the heap. And we often, honestly, if we uh, understand this, look that we hear such things in the news. And then to emphasize the point for the need of fathers, the encyclical goes on to say, fathers are not like this. They do not confuse authority with authoritarianism. They do not uh, confuse service with servility. They do not confuse discussion with oppression. They do not confuse charity with a welfare mentality. And they do not confuse power with destruction. And on your own, you can look and see how many of the leaders in those, la those latter statements are confusing that. So then the encyclical goes on to say, Every true vocation is born of the gift of oneself, which is the fruit of mature sacrifice. So the Holy Father in his letter is saying that fatherhood is a vocation. It's a call. Also, he states, motherhood is a call. Uh, a single state is a call. A call to the priesthood or religious life is a call. And it's all require a gift of oneself, which is the fruit of mature sacrifice. Now, how does that look in daily life? Well, when we consider fathers, we should consider fathers should be protectors. They should be people of service. They should be heroes in the eyes of their family, and they should be a stable resting point. Well, here's an example. An example of a little girl recently who was talking with great enthusiasm about her trip to the beach and the water and the big waves and so on. And the listener said to her, but that sounds dangerous. You better be careful. And the little girl straightened up and said, but 
my dad was there. That contains a whole world. If dad is there, I am safe. Now probably dad was there out of love for his little girl, but he might have personally wanted to take a refreshing, cool dip in the water, but he had to be near his child. And that was mature service to the answer of his vocation to be father. Or another example, two boys are riding their bicycle. Something happens to one of the boys. The other boy said, oh, don't worry. We'll take it to my dad. My dad can fix everything. Again, an example of service. The boy had experience that his dad stopped something that he thought was important and helped him out previously. So why shouldn't dad, who can fix everything, help out now? Or two boys or two girls or whoever are discussing and they're having, if you just listen to children in their conversations, it can be quite touching and also quite amusing. And as they go on, to end the conversation, one of them will say, but my dad says. And so my dad who says is right because my dad is right. Or the final example from every day, uh, Sanctity, which is one of our Schoenstatt books. Dads can be resting uh, stable points that point above. A, a man and his little girl are sitting near a window. Then the little girl says, Dad, is heaven up there? And she points out of the window and upward. Her dad says, yes, dear. Then the girl asks, can God see us sitting here at the window? And dad answers, yes, he can see us. And then the little girl says, then let's wave. Let's wave to the Christ child. Dad, if you do it, I will too. Let's both wave to the Christ child. And probably for the first time in his life, dad waved at the Christ child. All of these are things that come out of the heart, but they're born of the vocation and they touch the heart of the loved ones. So this really, these examples really illustrated the statement, every true vocation is born of the gift of oneself. Every dad in those examples had to give up a little bit of himself. And giving this up, is a fruit of mature sacrifice. Now, when we take these aforementioned examples, we're going to then apply them to what the lesson teaches. The first one, the protector, God had, the dad had to be close by. The example of service, God had to help, the dad had to help before the little boy could say this. The little boy needed experience. My dad says, shows that this child really accepted the authority of his dad and also the interest of his dad. Dad listened to him. It's quite different than a negative example where a boy sees his dad when his dad comes home from work or on the weekend. Dad has this wonderful expensive car and he's polishing it and he's cleaning it and he examines it for scratches. He takes excellent, excellent care of the car. So one day the boy says, Dad, why do you spend so much time with the car? And Dad stopped and said, well, it's my prized possession. And then, sadly, the boy sighed and said, I wish that I were your prize possession. So now, let's look once and see what the encyclical uh, Corde Patris, in the heart of a father, tells us. The example that's given is 
St. Joseph. And so in this year, our church has invited us to focus on St. Joseph. And we find specific qualities mentioned that make St. Joseph a model, a role model for every father, but also for all of us who try to live our vocation. So the first quality that's given in the encyclical, in the encyclical is Joseph was a beloved father. In our Schoenstatt interpretation, we could say Joseph was aware of his mission. He was filled with zeal for his mission and was devoted to his mission. He knew he was called, he was honored to be called, and he fulfilled and answered the call. The second point, Joseph was a trusting father. Often the tasks of everyday life kind of seem monotonous and not important, or they're daunting in the face of the realities of life. So again, we can look to St. Joseph. If we read between the lines of the gospel, we discover that Joseph's humdrum life of being the supporter and the teacher of Christ's child, his humanity from infancy until adulthood, cost much patience. Jesus learned to be a carpenter from St. Joseph. Christ was then able to provide for his mother later on the means that he had learned through his professional skills. Do you ever wonder sometime as when, Je when Jesus was in this learning from his father that he would say, Abba, can you fix that? Or Abba, how do we fix this or that? For a qual third quality, Joseph was an obedient father. We read that God made his wishes known to St. Joseph in dreams. We also suspect that at that time, dreams were very much of a culture. But the situation that St. Joseph was in at the time, and he has this dream where we say, an angel said, do not be afraid, but take Mary and the child. Do you think he could have said, is this really what God wants? Is this reality, or am I trying to make excuses? But we know for sure Joseph did take Mary and the child, and what a security it was for both of them. Fourthly, St. Joseph was an accepting father. The encyclical states so beautifully, and this is a quote, Joseph set aside his own ideas in order to accept the course of events and as mysterious as they seemed to embrace them, take responsibility for them, and make them part of his own history. In other words, the call demanded Joseph to change ideas. The call meant many sacrifices, but he incorporated them, the call, into his life and lived. The spiritual path that Joseph traces for us is not one that explains why or how. Joseph accepts. However, we realize, on the other hand, he just didn't passively accept because he had to also take care of a family. And that then leads to the fifth point. Joseph was a creatively courageous father. Joseph was a refugee. He had to find ways to support his family and be that pillar of strength. That took a lot of ingenuity and perseverance. And thus, we come to the sixth quality. That took work. Joseph was a working father. He, he courageously and untiringly tried to find employment. And then that leads to the seventh uh, 
point. Joseph was a father in the shadow, not a sh in the shadow in his family, not a shadow in the fulfilling his vocation, but the neighbors knew Joseph simply as the carpenter. And Jesus was known in the neighborhood as the carpenter's son. Now let's look once again at what the encyclical states so beautifully as we take inspirations and make them applicable to ourselves. Fathers are not born, but made. A father does not become a father simply by bringing a child into the world, but by taking up the responsibility to care for that child. We saw it in our everyday examples. We saw it now illustrated in the life of St. Joseph. Whenever a man accepts responsibility for the life of others, in the same way, he becomes a father to that person. So, if someone accepts, an, uh, he's an uncle, and he does fatherly things for his nephew, if he's for a grandfather, and he does fatherly things for his grandson, or if he is a father who really devotes himself to what God has called him to be. If a man has a deep sense for the vocation and trust in God, he will humbly be, place himself before our Lord and ask in a childlike manner for the strength, insight, and perseverance to fulfill his task. Now that means if a father realizes fatherhood is a vocation and it's a difficult vocation, he will pray and ask for help. And the father also is not in the task of parenting by himself. And this is where the mother comes into the play. It takes father and mother to form a family. It is the task of the wife, the mother of the children, to lead the children to him and to help him to be father. Now this can be done in little tiny incidents. For example, mom can say, we will ask daddy to fix that when he comes home. Or they will sense the mother's respect for their father. An example of this is a really quite young child who was at home with her mother and accidentally mother broke a glass. Now, in this little girl's head, that was a big no-no. Mommy had not been careful. So with big eyes, the little girl turns and looks at her mom and says, I am going to tell my daddy what you did. That child sense, daddy's important. He is an authority in our, our family. And then there are the times that also go to fatherhood that are the fun times, like playing little jokes on mommy. That can be a big thing. So it takes a mother and a father to make a father. Now we could continue with many one example after another, but I think you got enough of the idea. But the prime role of parents is to develop the whole child. And in Schoenstatt, when we talk about certain essential points, one of the th things that we talk about is organic thinking, loving, and living. And if we see that in this day and age, we probably think organic means tomatoes and lettuce and so on. No, that isn't what we mean. Actually, that term comes from Father Kenton it, and it's related to this. This is a hook. And I don't, this is going to be very simplistic to get the idea across that I want, but I hope it works. The truth is, God, the triune God, loves us 
so much. But God knows that he is pure spirit. And with our way of learning and interpreting, we need to use our senses. So what God did in the history of salvation was this. He lowered his qualities. He put down a hook, and through that hook, to bring us up to his heart. And that hook was the person of Jesus. If we carefully read the Gospels, Jesus says, He who sees me sees the Father. Or Philip, you've been so long with me and you don't know me yet. I think of the miracles of Jesus. He cared lovingly for the sick. He cared for the widows. He took a look out for the poor and so on. Those are all qualities and concern that God had. And if the people were, in modern terms, tuned in, they could relate the good, the kindness, the love, the mercy Jesus, and the power Jesus displayed, and that would draw them up to the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But God in his mercy even lowered this hook further. He gave us a mother. As Jesus left the earth, he said, to John, who represented the church, Behold your mother. And although Mary doesn't say much, we don't, in the gospel, we know of her attitudes, the same as the attitude of Jesus, directed toward the Father. We also know her concern about people. She, the Lord, they have no more wine, and so on. So, and God also knows that we, in our personal lives, all know what a mother is. And unconsciously and subconsciously, through our mother's loving care and service, are drawn up to Mary, who with Jesus then takes us to the Father. But this also, this hook element, God has lowered even further. And he's lowered in the family of the father and the mother who take care of the child and the other ch children when they're teeny tiny all the way through their life. Even when they seem to be independent, they follow them and pray for them and are concerned about them and help them. And it's the qualities of father and mother that translate up to the Heavenly Father. It's built into nature. And that is organic thinking, living, and loving. It's also the very, very uh, tangible truth of secondary causes. Jesus, a secondary cause for the triune God, Mary and Jesus, secondary causes for God, Father and Mother, secondary causes for leading up to the Heavenly Father. And so this then is a little example of fatherhood. It's an example of looking at the patron for the year who's been the protector of the church for 150 years. We looked into the encyclical in Apatris Corde with the Father's Heart. And now you will say, it's Father's Day, but you did not talk about the father and founder of Schoenstatt. And that is true, but it's not true. I tried to talk about something that was very important to him, the call to fatherhood and motherhood and family life. I tried to explain how an ordinary life, the importance of that mission, not only for the children's health 
for their, their learning, but also for their faith life. And so, I, we could also say, this Joseph, who was chosen to be a special instrument in the hand of God to invite Mary, along with those young men, to make the shrine a place of pilgrimage and grace, he also had a great contribution in what he taught, in what he lived, and what he showed us to be. And now, as I conclude, I would like to maybe present a little challenge to you. From this Covenant Sunday, June 18th, to July, it, actually today is June 20th, but it's July 18th that will be Covenant Sunday, maybe some of you could look a little bit into the life of Father Kentonick, our father and founder. We do have a lot of material from some of the early books. We have this one, Joseph Kentonick, A Life for the Church. That's rather a historical and scholarly book, but some people like that kind of thing. We also have something that's easier, and that is A Father to Many. And then we have Magic. Five volumes of brush strokes, starting with the beginning of Father Kentonick's life, all the way up until 45 and you know, till, until, uh, till the, uh, actually until uh, during the time in Milwaukee. And a more recent one is written by one of our sisters, but it also is a little bit scholarly. Scholarly, It's called The Hidden Years, Father Joseph Kentonick's Childhood and Youth, 1885 to 1910. And then by the same sister, there's another book, I don't have a copy here, A Life on the Edge of the Volcano. So, if you're interested, look in your library and see if you could actually spend a few minutes every day looking into the life of our father and founder. And now before we close, let's once again, on this 18th, bring to our mother and queen our contributions to the capital of grace. Now we renew our covenant. My queen, my mother, I give myself entirely to you, and to show my devotion to you, I consecrate to you this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my entire self without reserve. As I am your own, my good mother, guard me and defend me, as your property and possession. Amen. So thank you and have a blessed month.